Today is Sunday, July 3rd, 2016. We're at the beautiful Sheraton Hotel in Novi, Michigan, at the 41st Michigan Backgammon Summer Championship. Today I'm going to do a presentation on Backgammon is War. My name is Julius High. I am the co-chair of the membership committee in the United States Backgammon Federation. But today, I will be your commander. I am the commander from the Kansas City Backgammon Brigade. Now, some of you uh, may have been around during the Vietnam War. Is there anybody who was around during the 60s? <laughs> some of you uh, may have actually uh, fought in the war. Either you joined voluntarily, you may have been drafted, or maybe uh, you didn't like the war. Remember this guy? Edwin Starr. War! Absolutely. You guys remember that song? Yeah. <laughs> That's for all the guys who didn't like the war. So anyway, um, good, bad, or indifferent, there are some things to be learned from war, like improving your backgammon. So today we're going to learn how you can use the strategies, tactics, and the art of skirm warfare. Doesn't that sound like fun? Today I'm going to introduce you to some new backgammon terms. The beauty of doing one of these presentations is that you can create your own terms if you like. I know backgammon has been around for a long time. But anyway, we're, today we're going to learn about the BIC, the Backgammon Information Center. That's one of my secrets to improving my game. The most valuable point, the MVP, and the most outstanding weakness. Prisoners of War, and the art of skirmishing. So let's get started. Remember the theme is backgammon is war. So from now on, every time you start a new match, you are starting a new war. And we have the brackets. So you notice we have Sergeant Seawall playing Private Ryan. Remember that dude? And Lieutenant McKenzie, front and center playing Colonel Clink. That goes way back. But anyway, if you, play, if you learn how to play the war well, you'll win dollars. Now the board is a battlefield. This is where we do our fighting at. Um, has anybody here been in the war? Do we have any veterans here? Anybody who has uh, family members have been in the war? Or do you know some friends have been in the war? How about watch the war movie? <laughs> gotcha. So anyway, if you've ever uh, watched a war movie, they have like a command center or the tactical operations command. But this is the, the room where all of the commanders get together and they have all these screens up there showing where all their troops are at, where all their planes are at and tanks are at, etc. Well, you could do the same thing in backgammon. I call this here the Backgammon Information Center. This is an idea that I came up with. So basically, the idea of the Backgammon Information Center is, is you use one of these scorecards, and you have the doubling cube right here. But the idea is that you place the scorecard and the doubling cube on the side where you throw your dice at. And the idea is that two of the most important factors that determines how you make your moves is, number one, what is the match score? So by having the match score visible right there, you see it at all times. And also it's important to know where the doubling cube is. A lot of people, they leave the scorecard over here or they simply have it on a flat piece of paper and you just forget about it. How many times have you forgot to double? 
I know I do it sometimes, even with the sitting right here. But by, I've trained myself before I throw to see these two items right here. And thus we have the Backgammon Information Center. But I'll have to warn you, if you put a scorecard up like this here, everybody can see how you're doing. And then if you start beating someone prominent, the crowd will come by. They're like vultures. Everybody wants to see them go down. So just get used to it. If you don't like people watching you, you might not want to set up the Backgammon Information Center. Hey, wake up everybody. <laughs> now, which introduce me, introduces uh, the next concept. Each game is a new battle. So you got the war, and now each game is a battle. Now here's the beauty of backgammon. You both start with the same formation. You both start with the same number of soldiers. I know you've been calling them checkers, but from now on, they're soldiers. The objective is to win the most and lose the least from each battle. So, and finally, each battle is a series of skirmishes. Now your game plan will vary depending if you are even in the match, ahead in the match, or behind in the match. As you start to improve your backgammon skills, you will start doing this here. So by having that scorecard there, before you even throw the dice, you should get in the habit of checking the match score. Are you ahead, behind, or even? We won't have time to go into all of the uh, specific reasons why you would make certain moves, but that's the idea behind it. So anyway, we got this battle going on. We just started this game. So now we're gonna have a series of skirmishes, little individual battles, a few soldiers getting together. So today, we're gonna to learn the art of skirm warfare. We're gonna be skirming. Doesn't that sound like fun? As you were. Soldier Boy. Now, some of the younger crowd might know about Soldier Boy. Some of the older ones may never have heard of them. But, so what we have right here is we have the first platoon, the second platoon, the third platoon, and the fourth platoon. So, that's how we start out. But what your job is, is to get all of your soldiers working together and fighting as a one cohesive unit. The sooner you learn how to do that, the sooner you start winning backgammon. You might recognize a few of these soldiers right here. Like uh, this looks like uh, Karen Davis over here. So basically what we have is the backgammon ladies versus the backgammon dudes. <laughs> so it helps if you personalize these here. So when you go 13 to 7, you can say, Karen, to 7. But anyway, if you think of these as your personal soldiers, I think you'll start taking better care of your soldiers. That was a recruitment video. We always need more soldiers. But anyway, from now on, I want you to start thinking of the bar as your recruitment center. So when a blot is hit, a soldier dies. In war, soldiers die. In backgammon, the beauty of it is that you always get 15 soldiers. So if one dies, you get to replace them. So oftentimes, you get stuck on the bar for a while. So. What's been happening? Have you ever got stuck on the bar for a while, seeming like you could never get in? Well, I suggest you start recruiting better soldiers. Because what's happened is that these soldiers, they either failed the written exam or the physical exam. And we can't let them play in our battles. So don't worry about it. So wouldn't it be nice if you could pick your own soldiers? How would you like to have a Kiko or Mochi? 
as one of your soldiers. Wouldn't that be nice? Well, don't worry, you won't get to do that. But anyway, if you do get stuck on the bar, here's a, here's a few things you can do. You can have a drink. Um, talk to a pretty girl or a pretty guy. Sorry, ladies. Or you can watch TV. But anyway, just relax. Don't call security. Those were real gunshots. But from now on, I want you to start thinking about your dice as your weapons. So you get all kinds of weapons. Sometimes you might just need a little pistol to take out that blot on, on, on white seven, or sometimes you meet, might need a tanker. Or uh, if you're really getting in trouble, you might have to bring in the battleship. But anyway, start thinking of your dice as your weapons. Now, Here's another concept to think about. So when you hit a soldier and you put him on the bar, basically what's happened is that you've taken away one of his weapons. And if you hit two or more soldiers, you've taken away all of his weapons, unless he throws a double. So I don't know if you can see that, but that's Kathleen Barr. Does anyone know Kathleen Barr? Well, anyway, this is Kathleen Barr on the bar. The doubling cube, that's the bomb. So, if you learn how to use the bomb and you drop it at the right time, double and pass. They're just waving a little flag, game over. Or, if you don't necessarily double at the right time, or even if you do and they take it, they're just going to sit on their little rocket launcher right here and get ready to shoot it right back to you. So be careful. Now, you are the commander. From now on, when you're playing backgammon, remember, you are the commander. You might rec recognize this guy right here. This is uh, Colonel Ray Ray of the Reaganites right here. Anybody know who this guy is right here? Frank Talbot. He's got a big hat, doesn't he? <laughs> and how about this dude over here? Shrekie Riles. This is Bill Riles, the president of the United States Backgammon Federation. I'm sorry I had to shrek him up, but somebody had to. So anyway, when you see your other commanders, just give them a nice little interesting name, someone that uh, you might want to beat up on. Now, if you were in the Army, like me, back in 1975, stayed there three years, 10 months, and six days, but anyway, the idea is to get more money. To get more money, you got to get promoted. You got to get your stripes. So anyway, starting down here at the bottom, we have the novices. These are the privates. Those are the guys who have to do all the dirty work and everything like that. And it gets old. You get tired of doing that. You get tired of these other soldiers making you do all these things. But you have to do them because you want to learn how to become a better backgammon player. When you move up to the intermediate, you start going from sergeant, staff sergeant, sergeant first class, master sergeant, all the way up to sergeant major. So now, you know, you're starting to learn a little information and everything like that. When you really start getting good or you think you're really good, then you get to become an officer. Those are the guys that wear the press. So you got the second lieutenant, the first lieutenant, all the way up to the colonel. Now, if your fellow backgammon players think you're real good, they vote you to become a giant. When you're a giant, you're like a general. First, one star, two star, three star general. But there's XG who will gladly take on any of these little giants right here and just beat them on a regular basis. Now, right now, we don't have any five star generals. There's no official war going on. So we don't have one yet. But don't worry, one day there'll be another software to come along to Beat up on XG. Now, if anybody wants to know how to beat a giant, here you go. That's, what, that's how these giants feel when you beat them. 
They don't appreciate us non-Zions beating up on them. But I want you guys to know, that's from the Bible. That was David and Goliath. There are a lot of backgammon Davids here in the house waiting to beat up on these giants. Do we have any giants in the house? Any giants in the house? Where are you hiding at? Okay, we're coming to get you. Now, remember, you're the commander. So how do you improve your game? Well, in the military, you have to get promoted. So there are many proven ways to learn and improve your backgammon play. That was basic training. I had to take six weeks to do that, but I just did it in six seconds. How do you like that? <laughs> Has anybody ever went to basic training? Well, I guess backgammon players don't like to fight. That's all right with me. <laughs> well, anyway, has anybody read the backgammon boot camp? Aha, uh -huh, so you have been to boot camp. And rest in peace, Walter Trice. If you're looking for a good book to improve your game, I recommend Backgammon Boot Camp. And it's got a military theme to it. Or Conquering Backgammon by Ed Rosenblum. Has anybody read that book? It's all XG'd up. A lot of good information in there. So if you want to get better, I suggest you get a few books. As a matter of fact, they're selling books right next door. Carol's Boutique. Hey, this brings back a few memories. Has anybody played on GNU? Now, if you've really been around a long time, how about Jellyfish? Hey, Snowy? XG! That's the new one. But anyway, I suggest you get you some computer software and start letting the computer whip up on you. Now, so anyway, they're also known as bots. But the only bot that you really need to be concerned with while you're playing at the tournament is the MFB. My favorite bot, the most feared bot, the terribly talented Tau bot. <laughs> He's the only bot that you actually have to play in the tournament. Has anybody played Frank Tau bot? Did you beat him, or did he beat you? It's, I think it's a little unfair that we have to play against bots. But anyway, a couple of days ago, I spent the night at Frank's house, and he told me a little secret. He's French-Canadian, and his name is actually pronounced Talbot. So now I think, knowing this information, I can beat him. Instead, he beat me twice this weekend. Um, how many of you play online? You know, there's, there's many sites to play online. One of the ones that we use in the United States Backgammon Federation is Gridgammon, Safe Harbor Games, Backgammon Ace. How many people have Backgammon Ace on their phones? Only, there you go. That's uh, one of the latest ones put out by Mochi, uh, Yahoo Games. There are many places you can play online, but this is a good place where you can play backgammon players all around the world 24-7. Or you can put together a study group. This is when you get all your friends over there to, to someone's house and you sit around and you set up positions and you talk about them and then everybody's trying to help everybody out. So instead of trying to win their money or defame them or make yourself famous, you can learn together, work together. We're all friends. We all want to be better. Now, Anybody know Steve Sachs? Well, Steve Sachs is a backgammon teacher. Does anybody recognize this young lady? Nicole Kidman. Can you imagine this? Steve Sachs got to teach Nicole Kidman how to play backgammon. Wouldn't you like to have a student like that? Well, anyway, I was jealous. So you know what I did? I taught Rihanna. 
And believe it or not, Rihanna is starting to become a, a, a good player. She's already uh, playing at the championship level in my dreams. <laughs> <laughs> but I think about her when I'm teaching different students or whatever. So I recommend either you teach someone or you let someone teach you until you can teach somebody else. But for me, to be honest with you, when I had the backgammon study group going in full tilt, the more I taught, the more I learned, and the better I played, and the more I won. So if you want to really improve your game, start teaching somebody, and you will be surprised. Now, when I was doing my research, I found some interesting backgammon clothing. Sometimes you just, sometimes you have to wear the right clothes. Um, look at this real close right here. This is, this is for the ladies right here. But look at this guy, he's got briefs on with backgammon checkers right there. Have you guys ever seen that? It's on the internet, I didn't make it up. And for the guys, look at this lady here. She's got on a backgammon outfit. And for some of you older, uh, mature, let's say least more conservative people, you have this special little backgammon robe you can wear. But anyway, all this stuff is on the internet. All you gotta do is a little research. So anyway, uh, just a quick uh, overview. Each match is a war. The game is a battle. The board is the battlefield. The checkers are your soldiers. Dice are your weapons. The cube is the bomb. The bar is the recruitment center. And you are the commander. So remember, from now on, you're Commander McKenzie, you're Commander Donaldson, etc. That's the way I will address you from now on. Now, we have different battle plans. You call it blitzing, we attack. Racing. In the army, they say, double time! Huh! And then all the soldiers start running. Holding game, that's an ambush. We're just waiting for you to come around the corner. Priming. We're like building a little prison, and every checker or soldier that we capture is a prisoner of war. And the back game, that's survival. I mean, it's like you against all these people, unknown odds. Rihanna. Nance. Hi. Colbert. Yeah. Riri, Jim. Phil, Jamie, I'm here to flip you off. We go first. I'm worth the way. Now, when I first did this presentation, it was February the 7th, 2016, at the Texas Backgammon Championship in San Antonio. It was Super Bowl Sunday. I know, it's over, but what has happened is that the United States Backgammon Federation, we got a financial donation because somebody thought it would be a good idea to get this professionally videotaped so that we can put it on our website and make it available to other people. So, you get to see the Super Bowl again. Believe me guys, I, I'm, I don't worry about those things that I can't control. I'm gonna worry about the things that's next and that's, but we kept battling, and that's what we've been all year long. We've been a battle. So, you know, the commanders, they get together and, you know, they talk smack. And, then, you know, they try to get the troops all riled up. Well, you got to rile yourself up, too, sometimes. You got to get, get a little pep talk. So, anyway, I'm going to introduce you to a couple of new concepts here. Um, we're going to start getting into the backgammon meat right now. But, anyway, we're going to learn about the most valuable point and the most outstanding weakness. This is another approach to playing backgammon. But like any approach, nothing is foolproof. And those nasty dice, they have their way of wrecking the best plans of backgammon men and women. But anyway, we're going to learn about those. The most valuable point. This is the key point on the board. Now there is only one most valuable point at any point in time. Sometimes there are other valuable points, but
but your job is to find out the most valuable point. Now, whoever makes the MVP, they will get an advantage. So your game plan should be formed to make the MVP and prevent your opponent from making the MVP. So a skirmish will, de will develop and both opponents are going to be trying to make the MVP. So what happens when you go to war? First thing they do is they try to find what's the most valuable asset so they can take them out. We're going to take out communications. We're going to take out that mountain. We're going to take out that bridge. Well, you're going to be doing the same thing in backgammon. You're going to be taking out the most valuable point. So, this is, uh, this is the board right here. So as you can see, you have the Denver Broncos versus the Carolina Panthers. So the Carolina Panthers, they opened up with a 3-1, and they made their five point. So, without knowing a lot about the MVP yet, where do you think the most valuable point on the board is right now? Anybody? Very good. The f you said the five point? Your five point? Nope. Remember, the most valuable point is a point that's valuable for both players, for both commanders. So your five point is only valuable for you, for the Broncos. So try again. Where do you think the most valuable point is, anybody? Right, the bar point right here. So if the Panthers make this here, they have a four prime. They get an advantage. If you make if the Broncos make this point right here, they get an advantage. So this is the most valuable point. Let's take a look at another situation here. This time the Panthers, they open up with 6-1 and they made their bar point. So where do you think the most valuable point is? Anybody? 20 point. Right here, the 20 point. So this is now the next most valuable point right here. If the Panthers make it, once again, they have the four prime, and they trap these guys back here. But if you're able to, if the Broncos are able to make the 20 point, then they will get an advantage right there. So once again, the idea is that there's only one most valuable point, and it's valuable to both people. Once again, there's your MVP. Let's look at another one. In this case, the Panthers, they open up with 4-2, and they made their four point. So where's the most valuable point? Anybody? 20. Once again, this is the most valuable point right here. Now, the 18 point right here, this is what I refer to as an other valuable point. You will make it if you can, but the most valuable point is this one right here. Now let's look at one that's a little more complicated. In this case right here, there are two Panthers on the bar. He has a broken prime right here with a 17 point open. The Broncos over here, they have a blot on their one point and they have a gap over here in their seven point. And so don't worry about the dice right now. But what I'm trying to get you to think about is which one of these points would you consider to be the most valuable point? The 17, very good. Now, why did you choose that one? Yes. Good answer. Both sides want that point more than anyone. Right. So, someone pointed out that the 17 point is the most valuable point. Now, some may say, well, I need to cover this blot so that he won't get hit. Or some say, no, I might need to make, complete my prime by making my bar point right here. Or some may say I need to come up to the edge so I can jump out. But as you advance in backgammon, you will soon find out that if you don't get these two checkers out of here, your board is going to collapse. So the better you get at identifying the most valuable point, the better you will get at your backgammon game. So that's the first thing you need to, need to know. Okay, so once again, this is the most valuable point. 
This is another valuable point, another other valuable point. Okay, so now, now that we identified this uh, most valuable point, so now we're going to learn more about the art of skirm warfare. So the first thing is you determine the MVP. So what you want to do is you want to put your soldiers in the best positions to make the MVP. So you want to maximize the number of soldiers in direct range of the MVP. Direct range means within six, between the numbers of one and six. And um, it's most important that you position your first soldier first. So once you get your first soldier positioned, then you'll stop and reassess the situation, and then you'll put your second soldier in the best position. So if you go about working like this here, things will start happening. Now, I don't want to do a lot of math, but we all know that if you're one point away, we have 11 rolls that will either make that point or defend that point. Two, 12 rows, three, 13 rows, four and five, 15 rows, and six, 17 rows. Now this is a little something that you can do very quickly over the board that will help you out. So this is a shortcut that I developed. So if you have a soldier that's four away from the MVP, you count that as four. If you have a soldier that's two away from the MVP, you count that as two. If you add it up, that's a total of six. So you don't have to add up all the shots and everything. Now if you have one that was four away and one that was one away, the total is five. So what's better? Six is better than five. So if you just count, and we'll do a demonstration of that, but it's a simple way. I know there may be checkers in between there that might make some roles good, bad, or indifferent, but this is something simple that you can do to help you out. So this is all about skirmishing these little individual battles, trying to make MVPs. So, getting back to this most valuable point right here. So this is where they open with the 3-1, and you see we have the MVP right here on the bar point, which we already established. And now you roll a 3-2. So you have many choices. I put the top four choices down here um, for that XG came up with. Um, how would anybody play this here? I'll tell you what, save us a little time. So, how many people would play 24-21 and 13-11? Show of hands. Um, this is probably um, the one that most players would do, but guess what? You're wrong! So, remember, backgammon is war. You're in the military, so you know what that means? Some of your soldiers, fellow soldiers, got the wrong answer. Do you know what happens to you in boot camp? You have to do push-ups! And if even one person messes up, everybody has to do push-ups. Is there anybody in here capable of doing a push-up? <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, I know you're old and it's early in the morning and you're tired. So in the meantime, I hired these guys. I hired that guy to do push-ups for you. But remember, you got to be careful getting the wrong answer. Hey, have you guys ever seen that popular video, What Did the Fox Say? I like that one, and it kind of wakes you up. But the fox doesn't know how to play backgammon, so guess what? It's G. Hey, <laughs> XG knows all. So what would XG do? Hmm. Now, I don't know if you can read that real good, but XG says you should play 24, 22, 13, 10. How many people would have done that move? Of course, you've seen XG. I know how it works. 
You mess up over the board. You put it in XG. The XG says that. So from now on, you do that. But why did you do that? Well, because XG did it. But when you're playing, you don't have XG there. But this is when you can use the Art of Skirm Warfare. So from right here, this checker in your 24 is 6 away. This checker right here is 4 away. If you add that up, that comes to 10, right? But if you had done it the other way, you'd have a 6 and a 3, which is 9. What's better, 10 or 9? 10. Ten. So that's how you use Skirm Warfare. So the thing you want to do is you want to try to your first checker is the most important, your first soldier. So you move him first, so you get the best, your, your soldiers in the best place, because imagine they got the guns and they're trained on there and they're, they just dare that other person to step there on that point or come out here to the outfield. They'll just pick them off as they come around the corner. So anyway, so you put your first soldier down first, then you stop, look around, and then you put the other one down here. Julius, I didn't understand why 10 is better than nine. Well, because there are normally 17 sixes and 15 fours, but the difference is between three and four. With the three, normally you only have like 13 numbers right there. It's less numbers. So what you're trying to do is to maximize the number of dice rolls to make a point. Okay, continuing on. Remember the six one? And we said our MVP is right here on the 20 point. Once again, you roll that same 3-2 roll. So how would you go about doing that one? I'll help you out. It's the same concept. Once again, you're trying to make this point right here. So you have a 4 and a 2, which is 6. If you had brought your 3 up here, you'd have a 4 to 1, which is 5. 6 is better than 5. So you have more roles that are defending that point in case he slots that point or tries to make it or whatever. So same concept right there. Nothing will stand in our way. I'm finished. Where do you start? Star Wars. At the time, the new Star Wars movie was coming out. So we had to get Star Wars in there. You don't know the power of the dark side. Or nothing but great Well, anyway, I bet you guys didn't know this here. That on Star Wars, they play backgammon. Look, he's got his own little backgammon board. They have good taste, too. Uh, these are Jeffrey Parker boards. Expensive taste. So anyway, uh, we've changed characters right here. So anyway... Now we got uh, Chewbacca versus the Stormtroopers right here. But in this case right here, uh, it's a simple position right here, and you have a 4-2 to play. So the question is, do you make your 20-point, or do you make like your 4-point, or do something else crazy? Does anybody know that answer? Someone said 24, 20, 13 to 11. So you think that you should make this point. And the reason why you should make this point is you must remember the previous thing that this is the most valuable point. But how many people have been taught that the five point is the most important point, then the four point, then the seven point? Does everybody remember that lesson? Well, it's not always true. The golden point. The golden point. Is that the right wire? Well, some people say that. I didn't make up that rule. But anyway, how many people would make the four point, or have made the four point in similar situations like this here. Very good, thank you. And if you're a beginner, you might do this also too. So if you made that move. You disappoint me. <laughs> the commander will be disappointed. So you better start studying. So anyway, this is the correct move right here. Okay, that'll keep you awake. There won't be no sleeping in this room today. So anyway, here's something else to think about. I learned this from Mochi. When your opponent has 10 or more checkers in the attack zone, meaning on this side of the board, um, defense is more important. 
And also, this most valuable point is W20, and it's at the base of the prison right here. Now, I want you to start thinking of an anchor as a foxhole. Now, these soldiers right here, they are in trouble. If I ever catch my soldiers playing backgammon in a foxhole, there's going to be some reprehens going on. But anyway, once again, they have good taste. They have the Jeffrey Parker board right here. So, here's something to think about. If you make an advanced anchor on your opponent's four, five, or seven point, you effectively stop all attacks and primes. Think about it. When you're holding that anchor right there, can they blitz you? Can they attack you? Can they prime you? Maybe temporarily. So, it's very important to make an anchor. Now, the main two game plans that lead to gammons, once again, are attacks and primes, or blitzes and primes. So it's extremely important when leading in a match, you want to try to make a foxhole. If you can make the foxhole, you're less likely to get gammon. The other nice thing about making a, an anchor, a.k.a. foxhole, it'll take your opponent longer to double you. Because when you have the lead, you want the cube to like stay on one. You want him to win a whole bunch of games at one point and at a time. Now, on the other hand, if you're trailing in the match, you want to prevent your opponent from making the anchor. That's anchorology, but that's for another lesson. We don't have time for anchorology today. Security officer was easy, anybody could do it. it takes a certain breed. Anybody know who that is? The mall cop. Remember that dude? He hasn't made any movies lately, has he? Made two of them. Well, but he hasn't worked lately. No. So anyway, I found him a job, a backgammon job. So you see right here, you've made this anchor with the 4-2. So watch here carefully. See the mall cop right there? Mall cop, mall cop, mall cop. So the beauty of you making this advanced anchor is basically you have taking these soldiers right here and turn them into security guards. All they can do is just watch you, wait for you to leap out of there. So in effect, you're kind of getting a little advantage. So that's another reason why it's important to make this point right here. Okay. Are we having fun yet? Go as simple as that. Are you having fun yet? And, uh, Coach Pop says you guys need to be a little more nastier. I know some of you uh, backgammon players, you're just daintily hopping around the board and maybe not hitting or scared to leave a little blot out there. Well, anyway, the commander says you got to get a little more nastier. I mean, Pop said it. One of the best winning coaches around. So, Let's take a look at another situation right here. Uh, now we got the Lakers and the Spurs. They were in town at the time. As a matter of fact, I tried to go to that game, but I couldn't get a ticket. But anyway, so if you look right here, the Lakers, they have their six point and their four point, and the Spurs have an anchor over here. And in the meantime, um, you roll, you're the Lakers and you roll a 4-3. How would you play this 4-3, anybody? Step down. Step down? Like 13 to 9? You said split them down. Split them down. I'd split to the 5 and I'd bring down from the mid. You would split to the 5. Oh, you would bring this checker over here to the 20 and bring it down to the mid. Okay. Very good. How many people, uh, so you suggest this move right here? No, me. You didn't? Well, I, I, well, I was going to come down from the mid, but you could start the two point as well. Turn to the, I would so you would do another move, but I'm the commander, okay? So what I would like to know is how many people would come out here and play this three back here? I call this anchor jumping when you jump over anchor. Is there anybody here who would do that move? 
Hey, very good. Thank you very much. I see a few more hands in the back over there. Thank you. Okay, folks. Uh, there's. I have to apologize. Apologize. That's the wrong answer. <laughs> Steve had to apologize. But anyway, it's, it's quite common to jump over that anchor. But anyway, here's another concept to think about. Remember, this was backgammon is war. When you put your soldiers behind an anchor, they are effectively in the hospital. They're not dead, but they're not in the action anymore. I know some of you soldiers try to get out of fighting, so you might like fake an injury or shoot yourself in the foot just so you can be in the hospital and not be out there in the real battle out here. Now, on the other hand, if you make your one point, that's the cemetery. So if you make your one point, those soldiers are dead for the rest of this battle. They are out of the war. So think about that. So anyway, this is the correct move right here. Boy, I'm tired of hearing that little thing. I won't let him make that noise anymore. But anyway, um, that is the, uh, the correct play. As you can see here, 24, 20, 13, 10. Your strategy is to fight for an advanced anchor. So he has an advanced anchor, so you best be getting one also too. Otherwise, he's going to be on the mountaintop, and you're going to be down there in the valley, and he's going to be just spewing backgammon stuff on you all day long. So anyway, this is the battlefield you should be fighting in over here. So when your opponent has an anchor over here, you should be trying to make a blockade out here to keep him pinned down over here. America win this. It's suicide. Also at the time, uh, the new uh, Batman Superman movie was coming out. The greatest gladiator match in the history of the world. So anyway, I'm going to teach you another little quick concept here. Sometimes there's not a most valuable point. Because remember, the most valuable point is a point that's important for both sides. So really imagine this here, you're the commander, you've got all these soldiers, and you need to determine where you want to send your troops to. So if you don't have a most valuable point, then what you need to start looking for is your opponent's most outstanding weakness. So you're looking for a weakness to skirm, to have a little battle at. So, you're, so you want to focus on the MOW. If you focus on the MOW, it will often lead you to the correct game plan and checker play. So, mo well, mo money. So, and this is a bit, so now we have uh, Batman versus Superman over here. So, looking at this board right here, where do you think is the most outstanding weakness for Superman? Anybody? A weakness. You're looking for a weakness for Superman. Where is Superman weak at? And the answer is not kryptonite. It's the, it's the man on the 24th. Right. The blot. Blots are vulnerable. Soldiers by themselves are vulnerable. You can attack them. Very good. So, this is the most outstanding weakness. Okay, let's look at another position right here. Uh, once again, for Superman, where do you think is the most outstanding weakness? Someone suggested the 17 point right here. Once again, you have a single blot right here. Blots or soldiers by themselves are a weakness. And so you are trying to exploit that weakness. That's what we're looking for. Very good. That's your, end, that's your most outstanding weakness. Okay, let's look at another position right here. What is... Yes? Knowing if that's the most weakest spot, how to play the 2 one We're going we're to get to that in a minute. But right now, before you start attacking, you got to learn how to skirm. We're talking skirm warfare here, skirmishing. So anyway, let's look at a, another position right here. 
What do you think Superman's weakness is in this position right here? Okay, someone said uh, the, the 20 point over here, but it's Superman's weakness. I'm talking about Superman's weakness, not Batman's weakness, Superman's weakness. Now, up to now, you guys have been thinking about individual points. But have you ever played in a game when your opponent has five or more blocks? In this case right here, Superman has one, two, three, four, five, six blocks. That is a weakness. Would you agree? Could you imagine your soldiers all spread out? They can't help each other, they're not defending each other. That's a weakness. So, so anyway, here's some other most outstanding weaknesses that you might think about. Once again, single soldiers, AKA blots. Now, if you have two or more blots, the, the, the closest single soldier to home is, is a bigger weakness because if you hit the one that's closest to home, he's gonna lose more pips. Uh, if you have more than five single soldiers or if you have stacks of five points or more on a single point. So if you think about it, when you start out the game, you have five checkers on your six point and five on your 13 point. You start out with the weakness. So there's always most outstanding weaknesses and sometimes it might be like a stripped point. So how do we use skirm warfare to take advantage of these situations? So in this situation right here, you have a 2-1 to play. How would you play the 2-1, anybody? Someone says slot the five point. What would you do with your two? You bring it down here. All right. How many people would do this move right here? Where you split your 24 point with the one and you bring your two down here. Is there anybody in the room who would do that? I, know, I see that all the time over the board. Well, if you did that move. Just say no. <laughs> you remember her? That's right. Just like don't do drugs, don't split your 24 point. Just say no. So, anyway, your back men, I want you to start thinking about those as being uh, like prisoners of wars. So your plan is to build a prison, AKA a prime. So the best prison is for you to own six points in a row. So solid prisons are better than prisons with gaps. So five in a row is better than five points with a gap in the middle. And four in a row is better than three in a row and two in a row. Um, so the reason why, so if you have a prison, I learned this from uh, Walter Trice in backgammon boot camp. If you have your points together, you can build on the back where it's safer or you can build in the front. But if there's a gap in the middle, you have to throw exact numbers to make that point. So that's why they're, they're harder to fill in and everything like that. So now sometimes, you know, the prisoners, they escape. But what your job is, is to keep building the prison because eventually you're going to capture some more soldiers. And next time you capture some, you just want to make it a little more difficult for them to get out of there. I don't have time to go into this, uh, more about this here, but that's something to think about. So anyway, once again, the correct move is 13, 11, 6, 5. Because we've identified this as the most outstanding weakness. So our job, this is a prisoner of war, our job is to start building this prison. Moving over here has nothing to do with trying to keep this guy from escaping. Let's look at another situation. Remember this one right here? We said that this was the most outstanding weakness. So how would you play the 2-1 in this position right here? Anybody? I see somebody going like this. I don't know what that means, but I see him doing it. Uh, move both back now. You say move both of these guys back here. So Marty, you would go 24-23, 24-22. How long have you been playing back, Emma? Um, 40 years. Right, well believe it or not, you've been skirmishing all this time and might not have even known that, but how many people would do this move right here? I see it all the time over the board. I used to do that also too. But guess what if you did that move? Oh, get that out of here. 
You hear, what, you hear what Kramer just said? Get that out of here. So you got to do a little study and to improve your game right here. But anyway, XG says that this is the correct move. So basically, if you think about it, when you do this move right here, you're attacking the most outstanding weakness with a 6 and a 5. That's an 11. But if you'd only move one of those checkers up there, you're not putting your full and most, most soldiers in the best positions attacking that point. So we've identified the most outstanding weakness, so now we're putting our soldiers in place to attack at the best attack. Okay, in this situation right here, remember this one right here with the six blocks, and you threw a six five. I'll give you a hint on this one right here. The five is going to go bar to 20. So Batman's going to fly down here and just land right here. He's going to perch. Hopefully it's dark outside. But anyway, now you have a six to play. How are you going to play your six, anybody? To the 18? Oh, oh. To where? Oh, eight to two. Okay, you're, Batman's going to fly down here and land on this guy right here? Okay. Well, how many people would bring this? How many people think Batman would fly down here and come over here? If you did. And what does the gong mean? Bad. 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 You're off the show. <laughs> so anyway, the correct move is to hit this soldier right here. So the whole idea is that when your opponent has all of these blots or soldiers all spread out, you want to hit him and put him on the bar. And the reason behind that is that it makes it more difficult for him to consolidate his blots. Like he's going to use one of his soldiers to come in from the bar as opposed to having two, so, two uh, dice rolls available to consolidate. So you want to keep him from consolidating. You want to just pound him while he's all spread out. So anyway, finally, if you have a choice between the most valuable point and the most outstanding weakness, you should always choose the most valuable point. And if the most valuable point's not available, then you get the most outstanding weakness. Sometimes you'll have both, but XG will back this up. The MVP always outweighs the most outstanding weakness. So anyway, that's all for today. I hope you will start thinking about backgammon as war and use the strategies of skirmishing to improve your backgammon game. And thank you all for attending today. As you were, back to backgammon duty.